good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to those of you here in the penthouse and online. And today we are very happy to have with us Professor Harris Melonis from George Washington University. He's an associate professor of international affairs and political science. He works on issues of migration, nationality, and state building. His first book, The Politics of Nation Building, Making Connationals, Refugees, and Minorities, was published by Cambridge University Press and won multiple awards. His second book is Varieties of Nationalism, co-authored with Maya Tudor, also with Cambridge University Press. And he is also now working on issues of education, migration, diaspora politics, politics and published quite widely on those topics. So we will do it as always. Uh, Professor Melonis will do a short presentation of about 30 to 35 minutes, and then we will open it up to your questions, comments, and that's it. First, the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for everyone uh, take, making time in your busy schedule, I'm sure. Um, I hear you have classes until late, so I may be an in-between break or uh, uh, or not. So today I'm going to talk about immigration, and obviously there's so much to say. Immigration has been part of human history for as long as we know uh, humans were around. And uh, today it's not that this is one of these phenomena that has been with us for a long time, but it's no longer relevant. Uh, we're seeing a lot of immigration, forced and voluntary, uh, both. Um, and I would argue, and I have argued in other parts of my work, that we're going to see a lot more immigration uh, in the years to come. So this is uh, something that is very relevant for the past, but it's also really relevant today, but also in the future. Just to give you a sense of what I mean by that, um, a lot of you, and um, you have Nina Hall here, who's working on climate change, um, Climate-related forced migration is going to be um, a bigger topic every year. Uh, developmental or development-induced uh, um, human migration uh, has been around, but it's probably going to be uh, equally, if not more important in the future. And conflict-induced migration, of course, uh, you don't need to be reminded of that. You're studying in a school that has a lot of people who work on these issues. Um, be it um, the conflict, uh, the conflict in uh, in Ukraine, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, or um, uh, the multiple conflicts in the Middle East, they all create um, human uh, refugees, uh, refugees and and forced migrants. Um, not to go into internally displaced people, and that's a whole other issue of relating to migration. So migration, I think, I don't need to say more to to convince you it's very important. Now, a corollary topic, a, a related topic that obviously people are then thinking naturally about is what happens to people when they move, right? Do they integrate? How do their lives shape up in the new places they go? And this paper um, is an attempt to um, contribute some thoughts about this discussion, the discussion about immigrant integration, and or cultural assimilation, depending on the context that they find themselves, okay? Uh, now, in particular, this paper is exploring the role of education uh, on this process. And maybe counterintuitively, not the role of education once you arrive at the country of destination, wherever you end up um, uh, after you leave your uh, home country or your birth country, uh, but the education you may have received or not before you left your country. So the hypothesis we're going to be entertaining in this paper and testing uh, to, an, to the extent possible uh, relate to the impact that your education at the origin country has, as the title kind of uh, says, on your likelihood of culturally assimilating or integrating in your country of destination. Um, so that's the broad summary. Um, now you can zone out at certain points of the talk and you'll still know what I'm talking about uh, because that's basically in a nutshell what we're gonna be exploring. Um, 
the conclusion, just to give you a, a preview, what we find is that when you have received no education or you've received only education uh, that is uh, focusing on uh, giving you skills like literacy, let's say, or math or geometry, uh, you're more likely to culturally assimilate in the country of destination. Uh, and when your education has all of the above plus national content, in other words, some form of indoctrination into a particular national identity, you're less likely, at, at least for one or two generations, you're less likely to culturally um, assimilate in the country of destination. Um, that we measure, as you will see, through things like endo endogamy or not, and uh, whether you give, um, whether people gave uh, non-ethnic names to their, um, to their um, descendants. Okay, so that's the summary. So why are we doing that now? I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and I'm gonna go into, um, uh, if this uh, collaborates, let's see. Maybe. Oh, maybe this one, yeah. Um, nope. So, whoa, even better, like this. Oh, sorry, so it's actually, uh, it's took a nap. It's here. fine. Everybody can take a nap. Um, so um, the the first three minutes that I talked to you about were primarily about um, why you should care about this and today's world and all that. There is another audience, of course. Now, when you write academic papers, you need to make the reviewers care and want to publish it too. So now I'm going to switch a little bit gears and go into the mode that Ana Maria and others in our field would be more comfortable in. Um, because this is like the academic discipline that we're both uh, in. But the broader discussion is um, relevant to anyone, I think, no matter whether they study migration or not, right? Uh, so, I, I mean, it's equally important, I think, to even to my five-year-old son. Uh, so, uh, the motivation here from an academic point of view comes from the fact that we have a lot of work on immigrant integration, um, and we do know that um, the things that matter are things like features of the destination country, right? Where, where do you go to, of course, is important. Uh, but also uh, the literature has also pointed uh, to directions of, of, you know, focus have been on the characteristics of the immigrant. Uh, what's their religious background? What's their uh, educational level and so on and so forth. Uh, so, but usually these have been studied from perspective of skills. So you've all probably have heard about um, highly skilled professionals and how different countries are fighting for talent visas that are the most attractive. China having the 1,000th uh, you know, talents program, uh, India having its own program, every country trying to compete on that front. Um, the US has famously the O-1 visa program and others, uh, we both had it, I think, right? No, we just uh, <laughs> but anyway, they, they, everybody's trying to attract highly skilled workers. But we're um, so that's the way usually we think about education and and characteristics on that front. Um, today, I'm gonna uh, talk about education in a slightly different uh, way. Uh, so on the one hand, we have um, a lot of empirical studies. As I said, this is what I just finished talking about that talk about human capital transmission and how this affects uh, labor market outcomes. But fewer people have focused on the impact of education, on the two different, um, I, I shall uh, argue, uh, impact uh, impacts that education may have on individuals. So the one is what we could say, um, what Foucault would say is the domestication effect of education, uh, if you want to put it a little bit provocatively. In other words, all of you have been educated enough in this room, regardless of the national content that I'll get to it, that you're listening while I'm talking. Well, guess what? My four-year-old son, two years ago, that hadn't been exposed to enough schooling, was not, <laughs> right? This is not happening naturally. It's not natural for humans. They're not born with this ability that you now have. In fact, you're the most domesticated, right? You're at the master level. Uh, so so you, you, you get the point. So this uh, aspect of education 
um, which I'm now provocatively uh, trying to, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I'm almost criticizing, but obviously it's very useful because you can learn more by listening rather than talking over each other, um, uh, is, uh, has been documented in various studies, uh, some older, some more recent, and we know that education makes us more likely to internalize norms, uh, behaviors, and, and thus we expect that this type of education will have an effect, uh, but that effect will primarily be translated into um, uh, norms, skills, uh, and um, um, things that would make us better citizens, but not necessarily say much about how we feel or how we identify as humans, right? What type of identities we carry. Now, there is another um, strand in the literature, primarily recently spearheaded by Keith Darden, um, uh, and also with traditional, um, uh, more traditional works out there having made this point, like Eugene Weber in the case of France that we're setting up there, that education does not only have an effect in terms of norms or domestication or however you want to put it, but it also has an indoctrination character, right? Um, in other words, um, as Darden puts it in his unpublished manuscript, um, the, the idea here is that the same way that if I show you a triangle, you're all gonna, because you're educated, you'll say this is a triangle, you won't say it's a mountain. Similarly, you've learned that in school, right? And similarly, you've learned to say you're American or Chinese or Greek in school as well, or, or at home from people who were schooled at some point, right? So the, it all goes back to some type of education that people receive to, to have those categories. In other words, you're not born with that knowledge. Uh, we know that, for example, from Rousseau's famous story of the child that was raised by wolves and had no idea, for those of you who read these obscure texts like me, um, that's the example he gives when he wants to talk about what would be a tabula rasa kind of human, right? Uh, trust me, that person didn't identify as French or uh, Swiss or what have you. Um, so that's the other effect of education. So in this paper, we're trying to disentangle these two types um, and ask, answer this research question, which is basically, what is the role of education in the country of origin, as I said, um, uh, of, uh, for immigrants integration or incorporation in the country of destination, okay? So um, the whole process from now on in the paper will be for me to convince you that we have found the right strategy, if you if you like, to disentangle these effects and try to discern what effect one has versus the other. So um, the hypotheses that are obvious by now, I think, both because of my introduction and the previous slide, are very simple. Um, the education without national content should help people integrate faster. In other words, we should find more um, a higher degrees of civic integration because of the skill set. Uh, in other words, these transferable skills, like being able to listen, is important both in Germany in 1910 and in the US in 1910, right? And that's something you can, it's transferable. You've learned it at school and it can help you in other contexts. So for example, you know how to fill in a form. That's a transferable skill that, that you're literate, for example, and you can, you can actually um, abide by rules and deadlines, let's say, which, um, as you know, younger folks, uh, little kids, I always have my son in mind here, uh, hasn't been domesticated enough. <laughs> they, they cannot follow these type of directions. They're, they're resisting because they haven't um, internalize some of this. So the point here is that um, we should observe higher civic integration across the board with people that are educated versus people that are not educated. But then when people have been educated, but with national content, we expect them to be less likely to become exogamous, to marry outside of their group, and to uh, uh, adopt non-ethnic names uh, for lack of a better way of describing it, for their ch children, okay? So in this case, it makes more sense when I tell you that we did all this analysis in the United States of America 
at the turn of the 20th century. So uh, in this case, it would be adopting Americanized versions of names. So if you were, I don't know, um, Papadopoulos, you you know you became Papas at some point, or if your son was called Yanis, you turn it to John, which is the equivalent, right? So so how many people did that, and how many people didn't is kind of what we're looking at. Um, okay, so um, as I already alluded to, we're looking at the so-called age of mass migration. That's obviously a very American-centric uh, terminology because it's the age of mass migration for the United States of America, not in general necessarily. Um, and um, we're the reason we chose that period, be besides um, um, being easier to study this uh, back in time for one obvious reason, what is that reason? More educational systems had not adopted national content in the 19th century. If you were trying to do that today, it would be really hard to find countries that have zero national content in their educational systems. So the primary reason really should be bullet point number one that Vicky and I should have put. By the way, yeah, I had it in the first slide. This is co-authored work with uh, Vicky Fuka at Stanford University. Uh, I should have said that in the beginning. And we're actually introducing a third co-author because this is getting a bigger project than we both uh, antici had anticipated, um, especially empirically speaking, uh, uh, who is a neighbor of yours at EUI, Carmen Misiu. So uh, I don't know if she's ever visited. Uh, so, so the primary reason is first because in the 19th century, we have enough variation uh, in the education uh, systems of the countries of origin of the immigrants that came to the United States. And we're only focusing in the European countries where immigrants came in order to control for some obvious cultural, religious, and other types of um, uh, heterogeneity, of course, that existed in the immigration population. Not that we fully account for it, but that was the first step. And we still have about uh, 28 countries, depending on how you're counting, um, of origin here. So that gives us a wide variation in terms of education, both across countries, but more importantly, within countries over time. So for example, a country that doesn't have, has introduced schooling like the United Kingdom had introduced schooling earlier than many countries for industrialization purposes, at some point makes a conscious decision to, to introduce a lot more indoctrination content if you want, uh, or chauvinistic content if you want <laughs> uh, in its educational system. And that becomes, it, we can, you can find the minister who argues that uh, in favor of that, and you can find this type of information in the historical record. Um, so, so that's the um, that's the reason we go back in time. Another reason we go back in time in this particular case uh, has to do, and I here I describe some of the variation we have in the bullet point below, but I don't want to belabor the point. The other reason is um, that uh, we we get millions, literally. Um, from the countries we're looking at, of over 20 million observations, uh, in other words, individuals, um, are in this data set that is building on census data from the United States, which was a full census back in that time. So um, the data on education we have, um, we built on existing data sets. Uh, Anna Maria and I were talking about that yesterday. Uh, there have been some data sets, uh, in particular, um, uh, put together by economists uh, on in the introduction of compulsory schooling, which was also um, uh, gradual. Not every country in the world introduced compulsory schooling, a mandatory schooling for usually ages from 5 to 12 or 5 to 14. Uh, there was small variations in, age, uh, in ages there um, at different points in time, which uh, makes it, again, easier for us to disentangle some of these um, uh, effects of education that we're talking about. And then on top of that, we add, um, we do our own um, coding with secondary and primary sources of the content and try to see how many countries introduce compulsory schooling at the get-go with nationalist content versus countries that only introduce compulsory schooling without nationalism and only introduce nationalist content later on. So this way we're getting both, um, we're, we're trying to capture both variation across countries 
which is not the most important, as I said again, but then variation over time within a country, because obviously, it, uh, as will become apparent in the empirical section of the paper, um, it's it's much more potent and meaningful to see variation between a generation of you know Prussians who are schooled in the in the Prussian system without national content, how they vary with press Prussians just twenty years later who have been schooled in the new system with uh, national content. Yeah. I take the point that you focus more on the mm -hmm. Uh, other things change uh, for everybody, though, right? So, yeah, yeah, but that presumably we're trying to isolate the effect of that, and everybody should be equally. This would be a problem if we have a reason to believe that some individuals are di di um, differently, um, um, differently affected by those things. As long as those things are, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we we have all types of fixed effects, but the important variation is individual from this chair, individual from that chair, um, when they're in different countries, let's say you're in a country that you didn't have, because we have students to, I don't wanna confuse them. So one thing that we capture is you have an educational system without national content, you have one with, with a national content, we expect different effects, right? Okay. The other one is over time, right? Yeah. Yeah. So many things that make yeah. Difference. True. Yeah. So, so, so maybe we will continue. Yeah. We'll, yeah. We'll so the discussion after. Fair, but we we do have a ton of fixed effects, but theoretically that doesn't cover what you said. So we'll we'll get to this in the Q and A because I want to keep my promise that it won't, it won't be too much more than uh, thirty five minutes that I was given. Where are we now in time? <laughs> you still have time. Okay, so um, so the the new data set could be used for a variety of other things that you know uh, people can do, but we use it for this. So the dependent variables that I alluded to already um, are um, basically uh, two measures of civic integration. Um, it should be probably reversely written. The first one is uh, application for first papers, which comes before citizenship, of course. So how quickly, how how um, effective are you with bureaucracy, let's say, which presumably any type of education would make you more effective than no education. So that's the effect of civic integration we're trying to say. Um, and then uh, ultimately citizenship, although uh, theoretically that could be uh, disputed depending on the content. Uh, and then uh, the dependent variable in terms of uh, cultural assimilation is captured by these two things that I mentioned from the very beginning, endogamy and ethnic names. And we can talk about how we do that. So here I have put the empirical strategy, and that's going to answer your question. The empirical strategy in terms of words, and in the next slide, it's in terms of an equation. But the words part, for because I was told I should do it as I do it in my lecture for my students. So the words part is this. So basically, we compare the outcomes of immigrants, right? As I said earlier, exposed to mass schooling in the country of origin to the outcomes of those without exposure, which was the example, first of all, between the chairs, but also over time, you could say. Uh, we then compare outcomes of immigrants exposed to mass schooling with national content uh, in the country of origin to those without. So um, in this particular, uh, so this is the, the way we, we do that. Um, and we, we basically have, um, all sorts of, uh, because of the number of observations, we can have basically so many um, confounders, let's say, uh, controlled for um, that um, if there is a difference, it should have something to do. Let's, I, I'm pretty confident it has something to do with our independent variable rather than something else, but we can talk about that at the Q&A, I'll bracket that. So uh, what do we find? Uh, again, I, I'm not using statistical tables for um, uh, to enhance our understanding here. Um, I was also told not to go too far from the mic. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's hard. I guess I have a laser pointer, possibly. No. Uh, <laughs> or I can use the mouse. So um, here, what you see is that 
uh, if you look just on the effect of compulsory schooling without accounting for content, uh, the people uh, that have received compulsory schooling are much more likely, as you see here on the right, um, to apply for first papers. But we don't find um, any effect when it comes to the cultural assimilation variables. When the lines cross this line, this magic line here in the middle, that means they're not statistically significant. So, so, um, so we don't have a pattern there. Now, when we look at the effect of compulsory schooling plus national content, so uh, we don't we don't test, by the way, yet, although we will now. Um, national content independently of compulsory schooling, we could uh, do that as a robustness. Uh, but here, the modeling is, once you have compulsory schooling, what happens if you also have national content? And we see that this, the picture is very different. And the main difference that I want you to focus on, because again, the analysis will be, it's relatively prelim preliminary here. Um, you see that the cultural assimilation story becomes relevant. And the people with national content by now, you shouldn't be surprised, given that I built it up quite a bit, uh, are, you know, the Greek guy who thinks he's the descendant of Plato is not going to say, no, my son is not Pericles, he's Perry, uh, at the first generation at least, right? Maybe later. And they did. Uh, so this is an effect of one or two generations that we can talk about. We don't have data that can speak to what well, we actually do have data that ultimately assimilation does happen uh, for those early comers. Yeah. Uh, this is not, um, well, here, these are the dependent variables. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, so F and I, yeah, sorry. This is the names. Uh, these are the estimated effects. So, so these these are the estimated effects of the probability that you're going to. Uh, so these are um, pro the, basically these are small effects, as you can see. But they're yeah, yeah. So it's small, small relative, but but significant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, this is a preliminary analysis. The reason I'm I'm saying this over and over again. We had this conversation yesterday, and that may be relevant for the QA if you have some more ideas. We did follow the compulsory schooling um, variable because economists use it. But the problem with the compulsory schooling variable, once you go into the actual histories of, uh, not that economists don't go, but when you actually go, either you, no matter whether you're an economist or a political scientist or a sociologist, you realize that aspiration to school people does not mean actually schooling people. And um, we're about now, that's why we introduced the third co-author, we're about to also run this uh, with enrollment ratios and literacy rates that we get from different sources, because the compulsory schooling, frankly, may be um, capturing actual compulsory schooling in some cases, but not others. So we want to fix that problem. Uh, but that, that's why I keep on saying this preliminary. I don't expect the you know, we'll see what happens. I can't speak to what will happen there. Yeah, 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 no, no, I'm with you. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but it's, it gave me the opportunity yeah. to to make that clear because I'm dissatisfied with um, not doing that too. Uh, the So so people um, may ask, does this work also subnationally? So we, we try to find, um, uh, it's not the only case, obviously, that the, has subnational variation. In fact, I was surprised by how many countries have important subnational variation in their schooling curricula. Um, and possibly I was surprised just because of my own indoctrination in the Greek schooling system that is super centralized. So when you come from a system that is so centralized, I guess if you're Italian, you're not that uh, you know um, um, unfamiliar to decentralization because I, I think the centralization of the educational system happened very late here, if, it, if at all. Uh, but um, I was told that it was much more decentralized in the 19th century uh, by experts. So the point being here is that we focus uh, in one of those cases with decentralized with variation subnationally, and that's um, following the the unification of Germany, a very famous uh, unification case. Besides the Italian one, <laughs> um, we we get the introduction of national content from the very beginning in the Prussian schools, which are um, uh, already, of course, uh, 
have introduced compulsory schooling from very early on with also actually making my case that it wasn't implemented in 1763 everywhere. But gradually, the literacy rates of Prussia were really high already uh, by the mid uh, 19th century. But in places like um, Bavaria, for example, we have a very different curriculum that actually uh, um, uh, lasts and uh, lingers around, if you want, for another 20 years until uh, the emperor is fed up with it and says, we need to make these people loyal to Germany and make them say they're Germans, because they were actually much more identifying with local Bavarian identities up until uh, quite late. Of course, Bismarck tried with the Kulturkampf to, to break some of that, but uh, as it backfired with uh, Poles, it, in some cases, it backfired here too, to an extent. Um, so we compare in these two slides that you're going to see in a minute, we compare these two groups with each other. Yeah. Yeah, that would be... And that is internal variation, actually, because different things are happening within the country. That's why I say, but, but so, so, yeah, 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 yeah. That's why we have this. And in fact, um, we, we, in the cases that we have enough internal variation, that's a good point to raise here. For example, Austria-Hungary, uh, the Habsburg Empire, we don't treat it as one country. We break it down, actually, to, we had this longer conversation with Sergei and uh, and uh, Eugene yesterday about this, um, that basically Poland uh, is split between different empires and we treat each part of partition Poland differently in this, almost as a state, although it's not. And the good thing, well, of the census is that we can do that because the coders, the enumerators of the US census go down to detail and they say, He's, she is coming from Prussian Poland. Uh, they're coming from Congress Poland. So uh, in, in um, they have directives from uh, uh, their authorities to be as precise about the origin, which helps us, not, not in all censuses. Uh, I think that's more in the 1910s. So there are different guidances in different censuses, but we have enough to, uh, to link them because then you can link them. So what do we see here? It's, a, it's not as clear cut as the previous one, but we find that uh, basically uh, there is um, the effect on first papers by schooling alone, but we do find an ethnic names here. Oops, an ethnic, what happened here? Sorry. Yeah. Um, sorry, yeah. So this is a comparison between Prussia and Bavaria, right? So we, we do find uh, um, the impact of first papers, but we find this confusing. Uh, oops, why is this so sensitive? Let me just tell something very quickly. Can you, yes. How do you measure schooling? The effect of schooling on probability of the school? Schooling that continues variable. No, how it's either. How to read this effect? So this, this is. Sorry, it goes so fast. This you're very ahead of technology here. So this is the effect of comparison schooling alone. And I this is the compulsory schooling with nationals content. And we're looking at the, so you are comparing these effects between this graph and the other. So this is if you are Bavarian, right? So compulsory schooling, I guess, are not valid. It's not, doesn't mean they, they get you at the Yeah, uh, and they end the year, of course. It's, it's attached to, so if you're well, a five-year-old, if not you're, years of schooling. Not you do get the years of schooling because if you're 15 and you move to the US where co and you were from Bavaria, that's a good question actually for everybody to for those who care about the econometrics to understand. Um, because I'm not sure how many people are following which part of the talk. Um, so um I know you are, but uh there is, yeah. So <laughs> so so let this is really important. So the age of migration, we have it, of course, right? We know when somebody came. And from that, we're deducing, based on where they came from, what, how many years they were exposed to their country of origin schooling. So that is the, we, we know how much of that effect they have received. And we, and that's going back to the previous discussion, we know how much of that was under only comparison schooling or national content and so that's how we 
Is that making sense? Yeah. Uh, no, it varies as well, unfortunately, or fortunately from a variation point of view, but uh, but it's always around, or maybe you walked in after I said that, it's always between five and 14 or 12, uh, and, and and it takes a long time to be extended beyond 12 or uh, some pe some places have Sunday school only up until 15. So it's like church related uh, um, type of schooling. So again, we get this counterintuitive effect here um, in the sense that um, it's, um, you know, the naturalization effect I'm not as, as um, um, convinced about. And here you get um, this effect too, that it's not going exactly, we shouldn't see any, you know, this should not be, uh, it should be on the line. So we're still not um, uh, completely sure how to interpret why. One interpretation that uh, I have given to this finding is that perhaps naturalization in, for some people is not just a civic integration thing. Perhaps someone does not want to say I'm American and they want to keep just first papers, which gives them residency at that period. Uh, and they don't have to, you know, I've been a, a resident in the US for 21 years before I became an American citizen. And in fact, I was fine with that, right? Um, but again, yesterday we had the discussion, some people don't feel fine with that. So, so I'm not sure how to interpret that, but it could be consistent with like um, the similar point that you don't wanna get the second nationality because that means uh, cultural assimilation for you. So that's, but, but it's not super consistent with what I was saying so far. So that's why I'm, I'm opening this up for our Q and A. Uh, I'm almost done. Um, I want, um, let me jump over because you got the point about this subnational um, variation. So uh, I think uh, the setup allows us to disentangle this, uh, you know, first problem that we talked about, the disentangling, the effect of, uh, to the extent possible in, uh, in this paper, uh, the two different functions of schooling, the civic um, capital transmission versus the indoctrination, if you want, or national identity formation one. Um, we find that national schooling has an unambiguous effect on identity-related outcomes. Uh, again, the caveat being this finding on uh, naturalization that uh, could or could not be seen by some people, depending on where they're coming from, possibly also um, um, on naturalization. The next steps include um, how to treat minorities, because in this first analysis, which is preliminary, we didn't exclude minorities, so that could be uh, something that now uh, we're digging deeper in the data, we could exclude minorities, especially the ones that may have migrated because of the introduction of nationalist content in, in opposition to that introduction, right? So we don't want to uh, hypothesize the same effects for such people, right? Um, and then, um, as I said already, I alluded to the problem of aspiration versus treatment. Uh, we do have a dissatisfaction, uh, all of the co-authors, we're, we're, we're thinking that compulsory schooling is not the best measure. We need to interact it possibly with enrollment rates um, uh, or, or run enrollment rates uh, independently. So the policy implications, just to conclude, are, I think, uh, important. Uh, the, the, the fact that most migrants come from places that have introduced compulsory schooling because most of the world has introduced compulsory schooling uh, is um, important for, uh, important for uh, this paper as an implication. And what it says in a way is that since most immigrants come from schooled um, uh, background and most schooling systems have some elements of indoctrination, uh, if we want to enhance integration, uh, we need to think, uh, as receiving societies at least, we need to think about how we define, how ethnoculturally defined our uh, constitutive stories are, because um, cultural assimilation obviously will be really hard for the first and second generation at the very least. So that's uh, the last words that I wanted to share with you. Hopefully I'm not too much over time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, so let's open it up, and if possible, I would like the first question to go to a student. So, what do you want to get? Uh,
Hello, uh, thank you for your talk. My name is Massimo. I'm a first year Maya student here in Bologna. And I guess I have two questions. One, you alluded to my question at the end of when you were talking about the receiving countries. But the first one I wanted to ask is, how did you, or maybe you didn't control, or how do you control for variation of quality of schooling within a specific country? Because for, for example, within a city, there might be, you know, in a wealthier area, you might have more quality of education versus something in a rural area and how would that affect the mm -hmm. you know the integration of that individual once they go to a different country so that was my first question and then i was my other question was have you looked into the effect of nationalist schooling on the receiving country because obviously sometimes migrants don't have a choice whether of like the success of their integration within a society it's also based off of a lot of factors related to the place that they go anyway um so i'd be curious your response to both of those mm -hmm. thank you Okay, so should I go? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's since there are two questions, I should. So thank you so much. Um, the quality of schooling, we can't do too much about this. Um, in fact, historians often don't know of, of education systems, don't know that variation. I mean, they they know anecdotal things. They can tell you in this village or that village when there is archives. But um, oftentimes um, for the 19th century, we have to rely either on... Um, Ministry of Education kind of reports that um, don't always go into quality issues. They go into, you know, how many teachers they sent or how many buildings were built. So we know this type of hard stuff, but not about what goes on in the classroom as much. We do have some information, but it's very anecdotal. Um, but having said that, statistically speaking, what one could do, and again, it's not a perfect... Uh, uh, I think what you're suggesting says uh, even enrollment ratios may not be useful. In fact, many people have alluded to the fact that we should uh, only look at literacy. Again, sometimes literacy is self-reported. Sometimes uh, it depends on the how the census is being done in its country. Uh, but literacy may be a better indicator because you may be going to school and enrollment is there, but you may not have learned anything, right? So, so Again, it doesn't get to the actual quality, but it gets to some met metric that is actually more discernible than just going somewhere. Uh, you may be going somewhere and there may not be a teacher, for example, right? you may be or the teacher may not do anything, right? So the outcome is literacy uh, that you can get at large, uh, for the large numbers of people. Uh, but uh, excellent point. Um, the country of destination, yeah. No, no. Uh, the country of destination point, there are infinite things. We can talk about it there. Thank you. Um, but um, And my work is primarily on that front, actually. My early work on uh, nation building is exactly how countries um, uh, deal with diversity, if you want, or uh, how they um, choose to treat what I call non-core groups, groups that are not perceived as being assimilated um, to, the, uh, to the country of um, residence. Uh, and that... In my work, it was primarily dealing with what we would call ethnic or national minorities, but you can easily see how migrants, uh, especially long-term migrants, not uh, passing by migrants necessarily, could be a, a, a relevant um, uh, population for what I'm talking about. So um, I totally agree with you, but in, in this case, this would be a problem uh, in a particular way, which we're trying to control for. It's when, if people, if, if people, if some people go to enclaves and others don't, that could be a problem. And if that is related um, for our estimation, uh, because perhaps endogamy is not a result of national uh, schooling, uh, it, somebody could say it's a result of the fact that the people around you are all from the same group. Now, of course, this goes back to a further question. Well, why did they all go to the same place? Did they go just because it just so happened? or where they moved there by the authorities that received them, or did they all go to the same place because they all feel of the same kind, right? So, and that would bring us back to our variable. So discerning some of these, um, uh, we would need to do that to get this published because that's a, a comment we've received in the past. Um, so the knowing the destination policy sometimes can help us adjudicate whether what's actually the making the difference is our, our um, um, uh, proposed hypothesis or something else. Um, yeah. Okay. There was a hand in the back, I think, somewhere. 
no yeah no okay then yeah we, oh, oh sorry yes yeah, <laughs> yeah so. hi Hi, I'm Sadie. Um, I wanted to ask just through your research, if you found as um, more as more children of assimilated immigrants are becoming older, if there is a effect of decolonization movements and de-assimilation, because I know among like a lot of friends of mine, people have retaken the old names of like their ancestors, um, gone back to like the home countries and things like that. And it, a lot of them credit like the nationalist education that happened in America. So reaction to that, you're saying, yeah. So um, I'm not an expert on that um, literature, uh, which is primarily dominated by sociologists, um, which is not a bad thing. Uh, but they're studying, uh, what I know from their research is that they have found what you could call a third generation, so to speak, effect. Um, that is not always related to the mechanism you suggested. It could happen even without that effect that you suggested, although I don't think you're wrong. Um, so what they find is that the first generation comes and wants to integrate for, you know, employment reasons, social mobility reasons, you know, things that we all can think of. Um, and then the second generation is raised in that environment by those people who had to try really hard to fit in. And then only the third generation feels secure enough in a way, if you want uh, financially or employment wise, however you want to go to reclaim those, um, reclaim that heritage. So I think that fits with your question. Uh, now, I think the framework we could put this, maybe some of that can be exacerbated as a trend because of, um, uh, the type of education or the type of uh, narratives that a country of destination may or may not introduce in the schooling system, especially when your identity is the one that is being targeted by the educational system, right? Uh, meaning you are the meaningful other <laughs> that constitutes the us versus them, right? Uh, and that could lead to um, Triggering, obviously, Native Americans uh, are an example, a case in point here. Um, and I think your point definitely fits there. Um, and um, uh, to a lesser extent, to a less contrasting extent, um, um, African Americans, because it's not just a verse, uh, us versus them, there is uh, how we're dealing with the legacy of slavery and how we're thinking about the role of African Americans before they became part um, of the of the constitutive story of the United States, right? Um, so, so those are not the same, but there are uh, elements of that. Yeah. So that's not exactly immigration, of course, in the sense that we're talking about here, right? One is an indigenous group; the other is a group that was brought forced in a forced manner for labor uh, uh, as slaves. That's not the same, obviously. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And. Okay. Okay. And then Guido, and if you are online, then feel free to submit your questions online. We mm -hmm. see the box here. Thank you. I like a lot the, the question you asked and the presentation. So thanks a lot for that. My question would be the following. I try, and this was related to what I was asking before. The almost ideal experiment to <laughs> see whether national content has an impact on assimilation would be, let's say that I migrate and I have a twin brother who got national content in education, but I did not. And we both migrated the same, from the same place to the same country at the same time. And then you see which one of the two assimilate better. That's the almost idea. How far away is what you do from this ideal experiment. Obviously, the ideal is very difficult to achieve. Mm -hmm. Or you could achieve it anecdotally for one family, and then you would come and tell me, well, that's one family. <laughs> so it wouldn't convince you, even the ideal, <laughs> right? From an econometric point of view, that would be, uh, yeah, 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 exactly. You would need many twin brothers uh, or sisters. Um, so uh, I think the... Um, the first part of the study is more observational, standard observational, kind of like we have um, um, uh, a hypothesis that we find 
has some effect and then we control for a bunch of things. And the subnational test is the one that gets closer to what you're saying because uh, it's basically, uh, you know, a Bavarian could be um, here and the Prussian is next to the, you know, it's almost like the natural experiment of a border, right? And they're in the same climate, they're in the more or less same uh, economic, socioeconomic milieu. In fact, they're part of the same country in those 20 years. Uh, and they um, they do exhibit, again, not perfect pattern, as we said, but um, um, enough similarity to the overall that gives us confidence. So that would be the closest. And perhaps through our attempt to refine this, we could possibly um, uh, do more when it comes to minorities that we know more about uh, what they received as education. Uh, in fact, so in other words, you can have the same Jewish group that because one is here and the other is there, one had the school and the other didn't. And you could see when they come to New York, for example, the Ellis Island, what happens to the two different communities. Uh, I don't think this fits in this paper. We don't have space basically to go uh, to that. But that's, those are uh, ideas we're um, uh, trying to uh, entertain for spin-off papers that would get closer to what you're saying. In fact, we're thinking of excluding minorities from this paper because uh, of the, of the um, causal identification problems they introduce, uh, because it's unclear whether the mechanism uh, would be the same for them. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, so yeah, in the back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, professor, very interesting uh, uh, paper and presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask very quickly. Um, What's your name? Paul. Paul uh, yeah. I'm a second year Maya here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, um, in terms of policymaking for today, and, and mm -hmm. because here in Europe and the US, you know, immigration, immigration, immigration is mm -hmm. at the top of the political agenda. Um, what sort of maybe precautions or words of wisdom would you would you have for policymakers, considering that an immigrant, an European immigrant from Italy, Poland, Germany, in the uh, at the turn of the of the century, who left Europe, left for good. I mean, there was mm -hmm. no. I, I mean, I think it's fair to say there was very little intention of returning, right? So maybe there's an impetus for assimilation and for citizenship and, and for first papers to today where maybe somebody who migrates from Venezuela to the US for political economic reasons, maybe they they have more of a willingness to return once political conditions, economic conditions change in, in their country. Um, are there things variations and things in which your the results from your paper maybe you would urge caution in terms of of having that impetus to assimilate people into into the receiving country excellent questions um i will speak beyond the paper because i don't think the paper can speak to everything and that's a good thing in a way uh but we do so I thought you were going to go with technology here. I thought your question was going to be, you left Venezuela, but you basically never left because you can be in the United States. And in fact, it's not even about an enclave. You can actually have Venezuelan radio, Venezuelan TV, if I don't know if it's any good, but you know, <laughs> yeah. I thought that's where you're going, but I'm glad I intuitively grabbed your uh, your thought. <laughs> and And that does make it harder to culturally assimilate, which is why, actually to link it to the paper just a little bit, my, our policy implication, because you could draw many policy implications if you wanna draw other implications, but the, the spirit of our policy implication speaks to your point in the sense that in the United States, you can do all that, and that Venezuelan person can still say, I'm American of Venezuelan background. And that doesn't sound weird. But if you try to do that in 1980s or 1990s Greece, they would say, no, you're not Greek, you're Venezuelan, right? I mean, and I only, I'm putting that as a caveat for the decades because I've been away for a while and maybe 
my fellow Greeks today would say, no, of course you can, but uh, I, I, I don't think it's true. But, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, qualifying my statement with years because I was there then. Um, so, so, um, what's the difference between the U.S. and Greece? The constitutive story. How, what it means to be American is completely different from what it means to be uh, Greek or Chinese, um, or. South Korean even, which is a country that tried to go with a multicultural, you know, attempt and had even a, a ministry of multiculturalism introduced, but it's hard to overcome this racialized understanding of what it means to be Korean. In fact, I speak, it's not even racialized uh, only, I speak often to diaspora Koreans for my other book project that I'm working on, on uh, diaspora management policies, as I call them. Um, and they even tell me Korean Americans would go back in quotation mark, going back to your return point, even after three generations, and they would be standing out. They would tell me, well, they don't think of me as Korean. I'm racially Korean. We're Korean, pure blooded Koreans. We never uh, had exogamy in my family, but just the way I move my hands disqualifies me. You know, just the mannerisms that literally the mannerisms make me, before I even talk, they can tell I'm not Korean. Do you, see, do you see the so so it's it's complex to and it's difficult to give you know broad advice on this point irrespectively of what it means to be X in America your example could be so what the Venezuelan in South Korea will have a different situation to deal with right it goes back to the question about destination things right it, so clearly the destination matters here right. Uh, so that's definitely a generalizability caveat for our research, for sure. Uh, that same research in a country with an ethnoculturally def defi ethnocultural definition would be a very different story. In fact, it would be a very different story because a lot fewer people would have migrated voluntarily to it to start with, right? So there is a lot of things to be unpacked here, right? Um um, the left for good, I think I kind of touched to uh, touched on uh, because you're never really living anymore because of technology. You could, in your mind, you can always feel you're connected. I don't think people uh, who left with a financial crisis uh, from Italy or Greece or Spain, uh, just to pick on the pigs as they were so called then, um, and Portugal, they I don't think they ever felt they left for good, even if they have built families abroad. They don't consider themselves as uh, as much as immigrants as those people I'm studying. And that's because of technology. Um, yeah. Okay, John, yes, please. Excellent points, though. Yeah. Great presentation. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Kojan, and I teach a course here on global banking. Uh, we met at lunch. Yep. Um, my question is, uh, when I uh, attend presentations like this, I'm always trying to figure out what the practical application is, what the so what is, and then what the practical application is. Uh, would, I have a couple in my mind, but I'd rather hear mm -hmm. uh, what you have to say about that first, and then I can always you know, react. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the discussion we just had with Paul is in that direction, in the sense that um, one practical application is um, countries that don't have uh, a more civic understanding of nationhood and to make that clear, um, that don't believe that even naturalized citizens who are not coming from, they're not born or genetically related to the descendants of the, you know, the, the glorious nation they're from. Um, would be and and receive a lot of immigration would be um well advised to try to think of ways to move towards um changing that perception one way to do that is changing their own schooling system changing their own constitutive story in the very textbooks that they introduced national content in the 19th century, they could now go back and try to find, where am I saying that old Poles are X? And where am I saying in my book that old Turks are Y, right? Because if you keep on having that, then when they come, you'll never consider them as even potentially assimilable, right? And so on and so forth, right? So, um, 
so that's one practical implication. Another practical implication, of course, could be seen from the perspective of a migrant. The migrant um, can, migrants who are, want to leave a country because of regime type issues or because they're a repressed minority, or what have you, or for climate or other, when they are choosing where to go, uh, you know, they may be well advised to think of going to places where civic understandings of nationhood are more prevalent so that their assimilation uh, and integration is going to be easier. And they already do that, actually. So that's why I start with the first one, because that's the hardest one. Uh, you can draw a lot of other implications, but um, but those are some of the practical. Now, having said that, as I said to Paul, things have changed a lot since uh, you know the late 19th century, early 20th. But um, some some lessons can be drawn. Yeah, maybe this is a stretch taking the mm -hmm. findings. Mm -hmm. But uh, one from a policy viewpoint, is there a way to um, uh, facilitate the uh, assimilation of those? who uh, have the nationalist education. Mm -hmm. And then number two, from an enterprise viewpoint, a company, are there human capital implications uh, in terms of hiring and in terms of uh, training uh, that might be relevant here? Um, well, I mean, every country prefers educated migrants than non-educated. That's, I don't need to tell them that. They, they, they do it themselves, right? And that's why I gave um, in the very beginning those I, those examples of high skilled migrants that we all know about because, you know, we're kind of a group, uh, we're a self select group of people who are highly skilled, and we're thinking of people like us in this room and online uh, because we have the luxury to be dealing with this type of topics and uh, and and dispute econometric uh, causal identification models, but. Uh, that's already putting us, you know, we're we're already in that group. Um, so from that perspective, every country right now is competing for what they call talent, right? Uh, and broadly defined, it's not just uh, software engineers. It could be um, uh, anything, anyone who has an accounting degree or anyone who is a nurse, that's a highly skilled person when you have labor shortages on a lot of these fronts in a country. So that's obviously, it's... Um, it's interacting with the labor market of its destination place. So different countries have labor shortages at different things. Uh, unless you're a country that has huge labor shortages in the agricultural sector, um, you're going to be putting emphasis on, uh, on highly skilled uh, people. Having said that, even if you have labor shortages in the ruler sector, you also know that the highest uh, return will be from highly skilled. So you may have better policies for unskilled migrants than a country that doesn't need it, but you will again also try to attract the others. Whether you succeed or not, that's a different question. So, so that that is uh, depending on on the developmental model in a way uh, of a country. The first question, uh, the first suggestion. Um, yeah, there are other ways to facilitate the assimilation of um, nationally um, indoctrinated, if you want, of schooled people. Um, one obvious thing is to wait it out, right? Because as I said, these are not everlasting um, um, effects. Um, um, the, the other question, though, is the countries that have an ethnocultural understanding of nationhood do they want immigrants or not? If you look at the reaction, let's say, of Hungary during the 2015 so-called refugee crisis, um, they had like one, I don't know, I don't want to quantify it, it's being recorded, but maybe, I don't know, one hundredth of the number of refugees that Greece had at the time, like seven families, I think, or something like that. Um, uh, so it's a lot more than 100, um, a lot less, sorry. Um, but it was number one discussion topic on Hungarian TV and, and news, right? So, so uh, it's not what we, you and I think would be great for them to be, it, it's irrelevant to some of them because they don't want to go down that road, right? So. So it's irrelevant to give recommendations to people who don't want to adopt them, right? So that's my answer. So any other questions here, please. Oh, and then Anna Maria. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe we shall connect uh, uh, yeah. your colleague. I'm Francesco from the MEPP program here in Bologna. Um, 
I'd like to know what your thoughts are on the chronic brain drain that uh, is is hitting uh, most countries in the world and and is creating sort of these centers uh, around certain regions of of excellence and how that can be addressed. Excellent point, yeah. Actually, I'm working on this right now. Yeah. Anna Maria, do you want to add yeah, yours? Yeah, or? Wait, wait to play yeah. So my question is, it sounds like the lack of cultural assimilation in your presentation has a negative connotation. But I, um, I would argue with that because, um, you know, uh, keeping up uh, the... Um, uh, the background, the uh, the knowledge of the country of origin introduces a richness uh, that also can have e very positive economic implications. There's this literature on the impact of immigration on productivity, and it's also the um, different perspectives of people coming from uh, different countries, uh, um, and also the way they were trained and schooled uh, that um, helps from an economic point of view in terms of productivity. So I don't know if uh, we should aim to have uh, necessarily the cultural assimilation, definitely. We and should. better food, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> yes. Definitely, we should have the civic uh, um, assimilation, that I agree. And mm -hmm. then the other question is, uh, yeah. uh, I'm not sure you're capturing the impact of nationalist uh, education programs, but maybe I, I have the sense that you capture the impact of um, education. So I'm thinking about educated Americans. Also educated Americans, I think, uh, um, are less likely to adapt to the average. So if they have certain uh, uh, local traditions, uh, so they, you know, educated people tend to be a bit more critical and uh, um, to be uh, more um, uh, attached to their own point of view. Um, so I'm not sure to what- Are you extent. talking about professors? <laughs> <laughs> not just professors, uh, more I'm talking, people. yeah. Yeah. You're right. And older people usually also have the same uh, characteristic, right? Yeah. Which goes, so I, I, I thought a light bulb, as uh, Gru would say in Despicable Me, for those of you who are, have seen this movie, it's my son's favorite. <laughs> it's a cartoon. Uh, light bulb that came, I'll start with this one. Um, so in a way, are you suggesting that because national content, it links to some of what you were thinking, because of national content um, is usually introduced later in time, that maybe uh, the effect that we're capturing is just a more mature educational system rather than a national educational system? Is that kind of close to what? Because we try to code education without national content, and then we say, uh, at some point in 1850, let's say X country gets national content. And what does this mean? Uh, the textbook, instead of starting by saying, you know, um, uh, John and Jill went to the bridge. They say the great Romanian ancestors uh, who fought the Turks uh, since uh, time immemorial with their Orthodox uh, religion that they have since well, did this and that. Those are different texts. One is just descriptive. The other is actually glorifying certain characteristics and, and gives a name to it, right? So so we we think we capture that. But I what I'm thinking while you're talking is that, well, because of the timing of content coming always later, I'm, I'm keeping a mental note, perhaps um, there is something you know, that we could talk about as the maturity of the educational system, in the sense it gets more entrenched, and maybe we're also getting to what you're suggesting as a mechanism, which is more rigidity enters, more our way, the British way, or the beyond the we are British, but what is the British way? We we have to have tea at five or something like that. I don't know. Um, I don't know what they do. Uh, <laughs> I never lived there. Uh, I've visited many times. Um, so do, 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 I, so that's how I'm interpreting. Okay. Uh. Oh, hmm. Mm -hmm. But that should be actually, no, uh, the way we, 
we model it and we especially we, when we do it with enrollment ratios um especially in the Scandinavian countries where you know you get 85 percent literacy by the turn of the 18th century right I mean because of Protestantism which basically means they had to learn how to read because they needed that to be even married or to have any standing in society because of Protestantism uh we should be able to get um the effect of content independently, right? Because people have been thoroughly schooled for generations. But in other cases, you're right, it may be. So so there is variation actually, um, um, which unfortunately or not dovetails quite well with um, Protestant versus not. Uh, there is a, that's something in the paper is not explored, but uh, uh, it's an important variation when you look at the educational histories, almost all of the Protestant, if, I think all of the Protestant areas are much earlier literate than any, which of course it's obvious after you think about it why, uh, than any Catholic or Orthodox area of the world. So hands down, which may be explaining GDP per capita and other, you know, Weber wrote a whole book about this. I won't repeat it. Uh, it's a good read. Uh, now let's go to uh, the other question you asked. Um, uh, I don't, I, we, I didn't want cultural assimilation to sound like a negative, like lack of it to sound like a negative thing. I'm being an immigrant. All of the co-authors are Greek immigrants. <laughs> so um, so um, I think maybe that comes out from the fact that we think the Americanization movement saw that as a negative thing. So it's true. It's one thing what we think, but it's true that Woodrow Wilson definitely thought these people had to be culturally assimilated, right? So so maybe that we need to make that more clear that this is how the country of destination, going back to the previous discussion, saw that uh, normative space, right? So, and disentangle that from what the authors think. So that's a good mental note, uh, note to self and co-authors. Um, thank you for that. Brain drain, who? So that that's, uh, Francesco, that's a huge issue i come from a country that we you know we have a huge problem i think you know uh i don't know what other cases you're thinking about um i'm i was recently asked by uh one government agency in greece to help them reverse that brain drain and we ended up uh, having a big conference with um, um government officials as well in athens where we were thinking about this we ended up thinking about this differently though we ended up thinking about it as more through brain circulation, uh, we decided that the the discourse and the framework of brain drain and return is too limited. It doesn't take into account the fact that people have independent choice and freedom and lives. It's very ethnocentric or nation-centric if you think about it. Uh, and it's, for all of the above, it's doomed to failure if you try to do it in any you know forced way, right? People are going to move where their opportunities are, and as one of the colleagues there um, made it made a very interesting point, he said, "Well, we think that we can create brain gain, um, but the, what is the brain gain of returning someone who was I, I don't know I don't want to sound too American here, but." who was working at NVIDIA and you managed to take them out of that context and bring them to Greece, that's brain gain, right, in theory. And now they have no space to actually produce anything. And you haven't gained, a, it's actually brain deterioration because that person who was productive there has come back now and maybe is uh, you know, doing something completely irrelevant uh, to what they studied and they cannot actually perform. So what is the country gaining by bringing someone who is at the top of their potential somewhere else and could potentially even at the very least send remittances or you know um uh, bring over some people to study or even at some point make enough money to go and invest in that country of origin and build a new nvidia possibly uh you know hypothetically speaking um do, do you see what i'm saying so so and i thought her point was really well taken you know if i go back to greece now and I start working at a Greek university, no offense to my Greek colleagues, I will not have the same incentives to be productive as I do while being in the US academic context. It's just as clear as that. Will that will Greece gain enough of that? So there is a trade-off there, right? Uh, are you satisfied with a minimum productivity of a very productive individual? There are a lot of trade-offs and, and a lot of personal freedoms involved in this, right? 
Um, so it's a, it's a complicated topic, but countries are actively trying to either reverse brain gain, uh, the brain uh, drain, uh, and or increasingly they're trying to find ways of brain circulation, like visas for one year, or trying to uh, attract people at um, uh, their universities for a limited sort of time, uh, uh, limited time period, so that they kind of diffuse some of their practices to the people around them, things like that. Um, and again, you know, what I made the point about the Greek universities, it's not true for all countries, right? Perhaps if more British academics return to Britain, they could be equally productive to the what they were doing in the US. So it's specific to its country and its system, right? Uh, anyways, so I think I got to some of those. Thank you. And one final question? Yeah. Yes. So Hi. Uh, yeah, going back to your paper a little bit for mm -hmm. a second. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. It's no, that fault. was really interesting too. <laughs> um, I'm thinking more about how you, like, have you ever thought about how you could recreate what you're doing right now, but in a more modern context? And then going back to- I'm all ears. Yeah, no, just thinking about <laughs> it in the sense of, obviously it's it's difficult to measure that impact of nationalist rhetoric when it already exists and then how it can grow more. But I'm thinking about it in like, the emergence of social media and then mm -hmm. trying to measure like the the amount i don't even know how you would be able to do this but i'm just asking for maybe your thoughts on yeah, this yeah, about yeah. I how social idea. media could affect nationalist rhetoric within a within a country that's an excellent idea i think a paper could be written on um uh by creating a scale of sovereignism uh that's uh, what i do in the book with uh, maya tudor uh from oxford uh it's called varieties of nationalism. You can all buy it. <laughs> um, the besides the joke, uh, a very clear thing there is in our attempt to say, look, nationalism is often associated with terrible things, but it also is and has been associated with pretty good things, like fighting against colonialism. Somebody mentioned earlier, right? and um, liberation movements and so on and so forth, right? And even the emergence of capitalism and liberal democracy are intertwined with nationalism and nationalist ideas. Um, so, so, and the creation of a demos and so on and so forth, right? Uh, to found the democracy. So uh, the ancient Athenians believed they were coming out of the literal soil. They were autochthonous is the word, which means they were born out of the soil, they were molded by the mud of the Athenian territory, right? And they had such exclusionary understandings, yet they came up with a pretty neat system, uh, just a pure lottery to <laughs> fill positions in the in the government. So, but not every country, not every constitutive story is equally sovereignistic. It's equally engaged in denigrating the other to feel good for themselves. So if you were to create a scale of sovereignism, I think that would be the equivalent of what we're doing in that old uh, context. You could see whether people who come from extremely sovereignistic backgrounds, educationally, I mean, not themselves, uh, whether they're having a harder time to integrate because they think they're the descendants of Alexander the Great or, I don't know, of uh, Jenkins Han, uh, and they, they cannot possibly um, if you think those as, as good ancestors, Sergey, I know, <laughs> I don't know if those are good ancestors. I saw you laughing, but, but it's true. It's controversial, but many people feel proud to be descending from, you know, people that not everybody would be proud of, but the point is about whether, how, <laughs> you know, right. Um, uh, no, but the point is like, um, the, how you think about that. It's not who, that's that's what I'm trying to say. It's not about who you think you're descending from. It's how you were taught to think about that. Are you taught that because you are the descendant of X, you're superior to the rest? That's where sovereignism keeps up, keep, uh, comes in. Um, or are you just told you should be proud you're a descendant of X, period? Do you see the difference? One is necessarily denigrating others in order to make you feel better and proud. The other is just saying you should feel proud for being a descendant of that, period. It's possible. Anyways, on that note, <laughs> yes. spread the world. <laughs> yeah. On that note, and on yeah. that note, we are looking forward to coming here and presenting this paper in <laughs> a couple of months. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. okay, so thank you. Please join me in thanking Professor Melodis for the wonderful
Tranquilito.